guys, how's it going? Welcome to this week's recap video. It is beautiful out here today. It's been so cool and it's been overcast most of the day until just about like right now. Also, Aaron is just a little bit under the weather. I'm here, but I'm just, uh, I'm just gonna- Low key. Yeah, a little low key, a little more quiet than usual maybe. Yeah. I'm actually feeling okay, but um, talking kind of makes me want to cough. I got a little bit of a sore throat. So it's oh. not bad, it's just, you know, just kind of want to be low key. Your trooper, yeah. <laughs> a trooper to do the video. Wouldn't it be weird to do a recap video though without Aaron? So weird. I think it would be so weird. That's how it started though. Oh, well, I know, but I don't think anybody would like it <laughs> if they, if uh, we did a recap video without you now. You know what I think is there's, um, there's probably some people out there who are just like real mad that I'm involved. I don't think so. <laughs> probably. They're like, <laughs> I didn't sign up for this. <laughs> that Aaron. <laughs> Okay, let's jump into the videos from this last week. The first one was picking nectarines and trimming boxwoods. It was on the weekend. It was a really relaxed day. It was beautiful out. So we decided to go out to the orchard, pick some nectarines because they were just prime time. They were so good. We took them out to my parents. We actually stayed out with my parents for a couple of hours. Then we came in uh, back home, put Samantha down for her nap, and I snuck out and got some boxwoods trimmed. Uh, and then I took a break while we, your dad was over watching football. We had pizza, and then I came back out a little bit later and finished up <laughs> just a really a really nice day uh, Amy said I have several boxwoods in a shady area that I want to get big and be a nice structure focal point under 40 foot trees I haven't pruned them at all should I prune off the outer layer to help them thicken up and fill out more yes I would do that don't worry about going really deep into them just it the more you kind of prune them down the thicker they'll get because you prune out the you know the leader branches and then they create new ones new lateral branches and it really does help uh, shape them up pretty quickly macy said uh, laura i wear lots of black shirts also where do you get your black shirts uh, places where they're not super expensive so like target is a great one uh, old navy you can usually always find like this is old navy right here you can find a good black sweatshirt with a zipper or buttons i tend to for videos well in life really <laughs> I do like gardening is my life, so I want to wear comfortable things. So a lot of the times they're like not 100% the most flattering things. They'll be like bigger baggier shirts with buttons down the front because I can move in them. I can bend without worrying about showing too much skin because I don't like that. Um, and I like things with pockets, even like the little shirt pocket. I find I use that for little couplers and things. Uh, once it cools off enough, I'll start wearing vests and things again. And I love that because then I have extra pockets, super handy. Yeah, I just don't, I used to spend a lot on clothes, remember? We both did. We both did. It's we both like used our, to spend way more. Yeah, well, our priorities have changed. For me, I think what happened is that I started gaining some weight after we got married, <laughs> and then I just stopped <laughs> caring as much. <laughs> no, see, my excuse, that should be my excuse too, but mine is that um, we can't afford to buy as many new clothes because all of our money goes back into this garden. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, you're right. We could. We. I mean, we could shift. We could yeah. shift what we, you know, want to be doing. It's not as fun though. But... I would rather put in gardens around the Hartley and uh, get new plants and things than buy new clothes any day of the week. Yeah, hands down. Uh, Maddie said, if you do see a bug issue, what would you spray on your fruit trees? Typically, like in season. So we do a. I did a video about it. We did a dormant oil and liquid copper spray in the winter time and then usually you want to start in with a more of a contact insecticide I guess uh, in season if you're wanting to keep like worms out of your apples and cherries and things like that and I should have done that to my apples in fact we ended up uh, picking all of the apples off the trees because they all had wormholes I didn't spray them with anything if I was to see something on my trees and next year that I'll be spraying the the trees I would use like an all seasons horticultural oil or Captain Jack's dead bug and just do it on a, a schedule like every couple of weeks spray them certain trees you don't have to do as long like of course cherries they're way earlier fruit so you don't have to spray them as long usually I want to say pears you spray the longest I mean I would like to not spray it all that would be ideal so we'll move toward that as best we can in fact this next year we're going to be releasing predatory mites around areas where we have boxwoods in particular and I'm hoping I mean we're going to keep our spraying on other things to a bare minimum um, so that we don't, because if we spray, it'll kill the good mites too. So we're aware of that. Anyway, it's an interesting dynamic, really. Like you want healthy plants, but you don't want to spray. Like 
and yeah. there's always things in every area that you're afflicted by, so you're trying to figure out the best solution for your space. Anyway. Green Rock Garden said, the kids are just adorable and growing so fast. How many words can Samantha say now? Like a hundred. Oh, she can say, but they're not all like crackers, caca? Yeah, caca? sure. Um, well, words that we know, we know what they are. Yeah, we do. It's so cute. She, um, she gives a shot at whatever you end a sentence with. She'll always say that last word. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's, it's nothing close to what it actually sounds like, but she gives it a she shot. She tries. Last night it was so cute. She likes to stand on the windowsills. So you, you stand right by her so she can't fall off, but she likes to stand there and look out the window. And, um, like instead of going outside, she loves to go outside too, but she likes, Oh, that's my alarm. Sorry. I already put my tri-tip in the oven. <laughs> that was my alarm to do it. I just did it right before we started the video. Um, Anyway, we were up on the wind. She was up on the windowsill, and there was a little fly inside, and she kept saying "spider," but but with a super high pitched little yeah. girly voice, so cute. I kept telling her it's a fly, and she kept telling me it was a spider. I love that she's identifying so many things. Like I brought my drone in, and she looked at it. She's like airplane, mm -hmm. and you know, like she she knows like oh things that fly around. Right. Are, it's all an airplane. All an know? airplane. Penny said, do you fertilize your fruit trees? I was just advised to fertilize my Santa Rosa plum tree and my Bartlett pear tree. I've do never done that in 30 years. The plum is suffering from borers and pear has fire blight. Will fertilizer uh, fight those problems? Fertilizer won't fight those problems. Fertilizer can help maintain a healthy tree. Typically when your trees are healthy, they're not as prone to insect and fungal and bacteria. All those things um, can kind of like sense the weak one in the herd and that's the one that they will attack. So your trees may have been struggling a bit and then you know something attacked them i don't know as far as a plum tree with borers it depends on the extent of the bore damage i don't i am not aware of an organic solution for a boring insect there's no like organic systemic that i know of that a plant can take up and you know kind of kill from the inside out um the only one i'm aware of is the like the systemic insecticide which if if it's not an extensive bore problem you could hit your tree with some of that after it's done blooming this next spring so that it doesn't hurt the pollinators you do that um, forfeit any fruit that that plant sets just pull it off as it's forming and let the plant rest for a year um, let that systemic kind of take hold and hopefully eliminate the borers and then see you know go from there definitely start fertilizing um, tree tone is really good we should probably do ours uh, yeah because I, I haven't done any fertilizer on our fruit trees in a while did I do any this year? Was I it last year? I think I did. You did? I think I went I was like, put, something in my brain said that we did it, but... I'm pretty sure that I did most everything out in the South Garden this uh, spring. This spring, just one time. Yeah, with, right. For the trees Which we stuff. should probably do it, you know, maybe yeah, twice. Yeah, right. Your pear tree with the fire blight, there is a, sp a spray you can use. It's actually a wettable powder. The brand is Fertilome. It comes like in a little jar kind of thing. Uh, the active is streptomycin. And you spray it when the pear tree is in bloom. That is when the fire blight spreads around. And I think you spray it once a week for three weeks, if I'm not mistaken. It might just be two repeat applications. You'd have to read the label for that. Jojo said, can you please tell me the name of the trees that line your driveway across from boxwoods you were trimming? The ones with the pretty hot pink flowers underneath. Those are red point maples and they truly are like a stellar maple. They grow fast. Um, they haven't been around for a really long time. So I can't say that, you know, we haven't sometimes it's like less than a 20 year old tree, maybe. Yeah. And sometimes you figure out like 30 years down the road, like, oh, these trees only last 30 years or yeah. 40 years or whatever the case may be. But so far they've been amazing. They're not prone to any insect issues. They are prone to iron deficiency as many of our things are. So we have to treat pretty much all of our maples with chelated iron, but they seem to color up quicker than some other maples and they hold their color for longer and then they seem to drop their leaves like all in the same week mm -hmm. so it's one cleanup instead of just you know those trees that just kind of like spit leaves yeah. every once in a while for and months it, oh yeah and you feel like you're just always out there picking up leaves well red points kind of eliminate that issue next video is digging up and moving plants fertilizing the lawn and boxwood trimming so i moved I think I just moved iris in that video. I can't remember all of the things. I think I did a lot of transplanting this week, so I can't, one day kind of blurs to the next, but I did dig up some patches of yellow iris, divided them, cut them back and planted them out in the south garden because we are getting ready to kind of bulldoze that area in the back in uh, 
preparation for a new garden space back there. And then Aaron was fertilizing the lawn. So I actually sat in the back of the gator. Like my job was not hard. I just had to pull the lever open when he needed the fertilizer to be actively going out of the hopper. And then every time we would switch to another lawn, I'd have to close the, yeah. the lever so that the fertilizer would stop spreading. So I just got to sit there. You know, I watched a video of a guy, um, I think it's like Kelly's Country Life or something like that. And he, uh, he installed a, I don't know what you call it, but like a, an actuator or something like that where it opens and close, closes mechanically. Oh. And it's just like a little hydraulic, you know, open closer. He installed it himself? Yeah. I don't know if I'm brave enough to try something like that, but it would be nice to have a electric Instead of a, a Laura, a Laura <laughs> lever in I'll the back. Have, I'll just it's, have Laura. It's hard to close it. I had to use, we happen to have an extra DeWalt battery back there. And I needed like a rock or that battery is hard enough that I could just like tap it closed yeah. because I couldn't get the right, I couldn't get the right leverage to get it closed just all by myself. Oh, and then I did some more boxwood trimming. I'm almost done with the boxwood trimming. The only boxwoods I have left are the ones directly around the fireplace area. And this area usually goes really fast. So, yay. Everything's looking a lot better. Uh, you know, it makes the job a lot quicker. When I'm looking at those the boxwood circle in the back that's going to go away. But it's kind of nice that I didn't have to prune it. Yeah. Neighbor's horse is running by right back there so pretty. All right, guys, we have to take a little bit of a break and move to a different location because Benny's crew just showed up to start the brick work around the Hartley and I'm not going to dare tell them to not to wait. <laughs> We're going to move so they can get started. <laughs> Yay. Okay, quick change of location. Benny and his crew are going for it. I just talked to them. They're going to level out the whole area. I've been telling them because what, you know, your plan is kind of intricate. In yeah. The I just don't, you know, if it's, if it's off, like if, if you look down a lane and it's kind of like, you know, going to the side, like it's noticeable. It, right. It'll matter. Um, and I just reiterated, I was like, now we flagged this off, but it's, don't trust our it's marks. It's just a, like a very loose guide. That's not, yeah, that's not our strong point. That's why we hire people to do some certain things. Right. It is crazy how many times we can met both of us. Anything that requires measure. a tape measure is just like Aaron and Laura should not be involved. And we should not do those projects together, ever. Well, like the trees, um, <laughs> like we dug up that- uh, I had nothing to do with that. No, you didn't. But like, I dug up the grass out of one where I thought a tree was gonna go and it was off by like 20 feet. <laughs> Good job. Like, I don't even, I don't even, cause you <laughs> said, you were like, I think this, this hole looks like it's in the wrong spot. And I was like, yeah. no, no. <laughs> And maybe 20. it wasn't 20 feet. It might have been like 10 or 15, but like it was a lot. Significant. Like it wasn't, it wasn't inches. Yeah. Oh my goodness. So that makes me feel better about myself though, because that's how I roll. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think we were on Frank's question, which was where do you order your Espoma products? Am I right? I think that's one we were yeah. on. I'm in Missouri and it's so hard to get the products. I hate paying Amazon prices. Yeah. They can be expensive on Amazon. Um, you can go to Espoma's website and you can put in your, your uh, zip code and it's got like a retailer finder so it can uh, locate whoever carries their product nearest you uh, if you haven't already done that. You can have it drop shipped to True Value. Are True Value stores like widespread? I don't know. I think they are, aren't they? Um, I, well, it might be regional. I'm not sure. There's been a time or two where my parents carry their products. So we get some of their stuff there too, but... Um, Ooh, there was something flying through the air. Um, at one point, we needed larger bags of seed starting mix. All that my parents had were like the real little ones. And you guys know how much seed starting we do. I would have to buy. It's not a good, efficient, economical way to buy seed starting mix. Um, so we had some of the larger bags drop shipped to True Value. So that worked. But uh, any other suggestions? You can get some at uh, Lowe's and Home Depot. I, I don't think you can find the soils at those places but and they have like smaller bags mm. of things i don't think you can get the larger bags they've got like a limited amount yeah a lot of a lot of you know because like espoma likes to support um smaller garden yeah. centers independent garden centers mm -hmm. as they say uh and so like whatever they offer to home depot or lowe's it's, it's very limited it's kind of like proven winners proven winners and espoma are yeah. kind of the same that way like they support igc independent garden centers igcs first and foremost, and then yeah. they offer a limited amount to box store. Yeah, but yeah. it's funny because you will hear um, garden centers complain about like, oh, well, you're selling to, you know, you're selling to Home Depot. It's like, well, yeah, there's like five varieties that you right. can get, you know, <laughs> right. at Home Depot. So 
If 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 those five varieties are running you out of business, then you know, might be a little flimsy. <laughs> Uh, Jemmy or Jamie said, off topic, I've noticed, thanks to you, my hydrangea shows severe signs of chlorosis. I've been hitting them with soil acidifier. You said something about iron tone, so I bought a bag. How often should I be treating these? If I could figure out how to send a picture of them, I would. So chlorosis usually presents as a yellow leaf with deep green veins still. Um, and then when it gets more and more severe, the leaf will be more of an overall yellow appearance with usually burned tips. Typically, it's an issue that happens in areas with high pH. Um, the iron may be in the soil, but the soil is so high pH, it binds. The high alkalinity, it binds up those nutrients and makes them uh, in a form that the plants can't utilize. They cannot take it up. So what we have to do is we need to address soil level, which is soil acidifier, that sort of thing. So I don't know if you have a high pH issue or not. That's something that you should probably know or figure out. Um, what we do for ours, though, the quickest approach is to hit them with chelated iron. EDDHA, chelated iron. And uh, Aaron, you apply it. Uh, every, you can do it like every week, every couple weeks. Uh -huh. Usually you'll see results like pretty quick. Yeah. Um, like with, within a month, you'll probably see you'll see if it's working or not. And the EDDHA uh, chelated iron is an iron that has been formed, formulated into a, a substance that the plant can easily take up really quickly. Your soil acidifier and iron tone are a slower acting thing. So keep doing those. That's a good idea to do those, maybe a monthly or bi-monthly, and then do chelated iron more often. It, it's expensive when you buy it, like it'll make you go, uh, yeah. <laughs> and you buy a bag of it, but you need like a half teaspoon or a teaspoon per plant. It stretches very, very far. Um, so even with all the stuff we're treating, I feel like it could be worse, yeah. <laughs> you know? Uh, Kim French Home and Garden says, love seeing you and Aaron working together as a team. Wondering, there are so many varieties of boxwood. How do you know which is the best for your space? Thank you for all the knowledge and expertise that you share. Um, you know, I think it's trying them out. I, we've tried out several. We've got, well, we had North Stars. Those got pulled up. They were great, though. They were great. Uh, we will plant more of those. Uh, so we've got Sprinters, Winter Gems, and Green Mountain primarily. We're going to be putting in green velvets around the Hartley just because I believe that they are more resistant to spider mites. They're also a deeper green than some of your other boxwoods. What gives you the impression that they are better with spider mites? Because I've, I've seen what green velvets look like. Oh. I see them at stores. I see them uh, in other people's gardens. And I'm feeling like, one, it would be good to get some experience with a different variety. Sure. Um, I like the depth of green. I like instead of that like really bright green that can tend uh, to brown and bronze in the winter, I kind of want that really dark glossy sure. green. Um, in our experience so far, sprinters have been fast growing, but they've got a different growth structure than winter gems. They're a little bit more like upright, a little bit... Um, Base shape sort of? Yeah, and they don't, they're not spreading out. Like winter gems really create a structure, like a structure network of branches, while sprinters are kind of like upright and they seem to weigh a little bit more like when you get rain, heavy rains or snow, things like that. And they're showing spider mite damage tremendously bad, <laughs> like way worse than the rest of our boxwoods on our entire place. We've got like on the west side, we've got all three, the Green, Mount, Green Mountain, Winter Gem and Sprinters. Green Mountains show a little bit of mite damage, but not as much as Sprinters and Winter Gems the same. Um, so it makes me a little bit like, oh, we, we went all in with Sprinters and we put them everywhere. Um, they have rebounded though, so there's that. We weren't spraying like we should have. Um, so I think so long as we continue with that, I think they will be completely fine. But you know, you just learn different things with different, you know, and every year is a little bit different. I know that that's super convoluted answer, but um, there's one, there's the um, Mount Brunos. My parents have these Mount Brunos and they carry them too. They bring in a bunch of them every year, uh, but they are a fairly dwarf. Like they stay in a fairly small shape, just naturally on their own. Never have had a, like a stitch of mite damage on them. My parents deal with the same mite things that we do. Um, so that's a good one. Anyway. Barb said, when do you fertilize your boxwoods? I just hedged my box leaf euonymus and was unsure if I should be giving them any plant tone at this time. We aren't typically, we give our boxwoods fertilizer in the early spring, plant tone, uh, and then we repeat if they're lucky. <laughs> we repeat like early summer. But typically I shy away from doing any major fertilizing this time of year when we're kind of, things are slowing down. Um, I don't want to encourage a bunch of new growth, especially because I just trimmed them. <laughs> 
has trimmed the boxwoods. I don't want them to fluff out again a whole bunch before winter. And if you encourage a bunch of fresh tender growth right before it gets cold, it's just more prone to winter damage. If you get a weird cold snap or something like that, then they're just prone to it a little bit more. Karen said, do you still have your pearl glam beauty barrier? Did that garden get moved? We haven't had that plant for like three years, Karen. <laughs> I don't- Oh, five. Five years? Probably. Yeah, that hasn't been in our garden for a long time. So we tried it at the base of the angel statue. It did not thrive. We tried it again. I planted them again the next season because I thought, well, maybe I wasn't watering them properly. Maybe, you know, let's just give it another try. Did the same, same thing. They what, just, is that a shade plant? No. But I think it, they, we should try it again in the South Garden. Like full sun. The full sun. It did get full morning sun and, um, well, probably until... How can you say full morning sun? It's different. Full morning sun, full afternoon sun. Six to eight hours makes it's full sun. So it can be full morning sun or full afternoon sun. Sure. Legitimately, Aaron. But I think if you were trying to make the case that something needed shade, you'd be like, oh, it's just, it's just morning sun. It's not full morning sun. It's just morning sun. There's a difference. Is there? Yes. So we got full morning sun until like, um, I want to say mid afternoon. I've got roses and salvia beneath the angel right now and they do great. So if salvias and roses will do well there, a full sun plant should do just as good. I would imagine. I think they were iron deficient and we weren't really thinking that way we at the time. We hadn't really figured that all out. No, we hadn't. And I think that they like more acidity than we have. Um, but we could try them in a the South garden because it's a beautiful plant. Yeah. Beautiful. Pam said, so glad to see the iris transplant video. It gives me inspiration to move some on my property. Question, when buying smaller boxwoods, one gallon or smaller, when is the best time to start trimming them and how do I shape them so they grow into a sphere or cone? After two seasons, mine are just starting to get enough new growth to trim, but not sure how to get the shape I want. Thanks to you and Erin for all uh, your good advice and tips you give us. I would just take after them slowly. Um, start taking just a little bit off. Don't go too deep into the plant. Um, it might take you a few seasons to get there, but if you're wanting to do a cone, just barely shave some off, even if it's not the whole plant, even if it's just kind of like this, you know, just to kind of start getting that shape a little bit. Um, the last thing you want to do is accidentally take too much off. We had um, our boxes in Versailles. Remember that? Mm -hmm. it, we, it wasn't Aaron or I. We had somebody else here helping. No, nobody that's here currently. And we just wanted a tiny bit taken off the top because they were babies. And oh, do you how much was taken off? Like into the deep hardwood of the plant. Yeah. They struggled for a couple of years. They did struggle. And when I saw that, <laughs> it's, I, I, yeah, I just, it was like a stomach drop moment where I knew that these poor plants, it was right before winter and that's one of those times where I learned how to be a better teacher <laughs> or a better, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Just go after it slowly and it, you build confidence too. The more you do it, the more confident you will be. And then it's just a more, more fun experience and less kind of scary. Next video was harvesting raspberries and other fruit plus a tabletop fountain in the Hartley. So I harvested our heritage and fall gold raspberries, gave you kind of an update of that area, harvested nectarines, and then uh, we had just picked up, I think it was the day before, a little tabletop fountain at Franz Witte when Aaron and I were out on our date day. And it's just perfect. It's on the floor because I thought, I saw it displayed inside Franz Witte in their interior area. And I couldn't tell that it was splattering right there. It must have been a little bit because it, it does splatter tiny, tiny little bit. Um, and I wanted a fountain that I could not have necessarily on the floor, taking up floor space, even though it's like itty bitty, it's little. It is on the floor now because I don't really want it wrecking any of our surfaces in there. I think I'm gonna bring in a, like a concrete pillar. I've got one up in the front sun porch that doesn't have anything on it. I think I'll bring that in there so I can lift it up off the ground so you can enjoy the look of the fountain. But the sound of the water it's perfect. It's like just enough to feel like that relax. It's got the relaxed vibes in there, but it's not so much that sometimes fountains can be too much. It's just perfect. I love it. Jenny said, do your raspberry bushes have thorns? Yes. Yes, they do. I think there are some thornless varieties out there. Should have planted them. Well, I, th I like these though. I like heritage and I like fall golds. I have the most experience with them. 
And so that's just, you kind of lean on those things, especially when you're planting your whole bed full of them, you know. Ina said, so would you consider blackberry more of an aggressive grower than raspberry? You know, my, my experience with blackberries are fairly limited. I've only ever really had them in containers up to this point. So I'll probably be able to answer that question a little bit better in a couple of years. But based on the raspberry growth that you saw this year, I don't know which one's more aggressive. Those raspberry suckers are popping up everywhere, which in our case right now, it's fine because I want them to pop up, especially around the fall gold so that I can dig them up and replant them. We don't have a full bed of those yet. Um, and we did get a lot of growth on the blackberries, but I'll be able to let you know a little bit later on that. Rochelle said, do raspberry patches have a life expectancy? I planted a patch five years ago in the last few years, they've slowly fizzled out and dried up. What do you think causes that? It can be several different factors. Um, you know, just as an example, so my parents' garden, if you've seen a garden tour through there or any of the projects we've done in their vegetable garden, they have a couple rows of raspberries, which were there when we bought the house in 1990, when I was a little girl. Uh, so they have been there for 32 plus years most of them, except for they've got a little patch of fall golds, and that's where I fell, fell in love with that variety. I love them. But all the rest of them are the original berries that were there at that time. Wow. So the way that they treat them, they mow them down every single year, all the way like I did with some of ours. Even though they're an ever-bearing variety, they mow them down, it kind of rejuvenates them, they thin them out, uh, and then they give them fertilizer. So a lot, a lot of times it's garden tone is probably what they give them. Berry tone is really great. That's what we gave ours. So yeah, I would check water situation, I would fertilize, I would thin them, I would mow them down, rejuvenate them, and see what, what you get. Marjorie said, when is your first frost date this year? I will have to look that up. It's usually like the first week of October, right? First frost date, our zip code. Coming and, up soon. Oh, I, I kind of forget that it's, it's the first day of fall today. Yeah. September 22nd. Okay, it says that our average first uh, frost, fall frost, light frost, is October the 4th. Mm. We have a 157 day growing season. I would say that's about accurate. Some seasons though, it's like late October when it actually does a frost. Yeah. We'll see what happens. Uh, Gunta said, not to be the voice of doom, but who and how will you clean all that glass? I live in Colorado, the land of endless dust. I assume you have to, as our climates are similar. Um, you know, I've cleaned it. We have a guy we can call that does a great job with windows, um, and he has cleaned it. He does it fast. Mm -hmm. That's the thing. Those those guys that are all when set, they're, yeah, when they're set when they're up. set up to do it, they just like zip through it super fast while you look at this thing, feeling like it's this daunting, and it yeah. and it is when you don't have the right stuff. Um, you know, the windows on our house are lucky to get done what like once with the change of season. Like, it seems like after. Christmas, and then like maybe once in the spring, maybe once in the summer, once in the fall. Seems about right. What's a normal amount of time to wash your windows? I don't know. Ours probably get, I mean, there are like, some. Growing up as a kid, I don't remember, I mean, we washed like the inside of the windows, but I don't remember ever washing the outside or, or seeing my parents wash them or hiring someone well, to wash them. Well, were you honed in on those kinds of things? I probably. just don't think it happened. Oh, your mom did them. You think? Oh yeah. Maybe I just wasn't paying attention. Yeah. I never have been in your parents' home and thought, oh my word, they need to clean their windows. Not even when we were dating and you know, they're in their old I house. I wouldn't even notice that. I would. Would you? <laughs> That's funny. You guys, I notice windows and I notice baseboards. I know everybody Do has their things. Do not invite Laura to your house. No, I don't notice. She will notice, notice your windows and your baseboards. <laughs> That's like, this... it's like the, I don't know. Everybody has their thing. Yeah, I Like suppose. some people it might be clutter. Some people it might be like counters. Yeah. There are some windows in our house. So like, you know, our kitchen door is glass and then like a border, door border. And the kids are, you know, constantly with their hands and their face on it. So we do wash that once a week with Windex, just mm -hmm. real quick, just wash the inside and outside so that there's no smudges and stuff. Sure. Um, and then there's a couple others that are like that, but anyway. I'm hoping that the dust level is cut down significantly here for fairly soon. Yeah. <laughs> I say that as well, like right now we're getting the area around the Hartley, like they're starting it today, right at the time Chad comes to level the new property yeah. and just create a massive dust bowl again right there. We'll mulch it. <laughs> we'll mulch the whole thing. No big deal. 
Uh, the Mama Bear Life says, I'm curious, you've been so adamant about how people shouldn't get refunds on plants. Did you get a refund on that tree? <laughs> That's a really good question. Yeah, it is a good question. Because mm -hmm. I, I thought about that. I was like, you know, some people are going to wonder. Because uh -huh. it, you know, you could see how it's, it could seem hypocritical. Yeah, I mean, if you've been watching our videos for long enough, you've heard me talk about plant guarantee policy. because, And I think everybody's background and perception of it is a little bit different. But I come from a garden center background where um, we were dealing with containerized plants. You know, the whole root ball is inside the container of the plant. Um, we didn't do any growing ourselves or digging. We didn't have bare root trees and things like that. I mean, we just had like containerized things that were used to that. They were being cared for like that. And the, the thing that would burn me. So there were sometimes it didn't burn me. Like somebody would buy a $400 specimen evergreen. That's an investment of a plant. I know that person who would spend that kind of money on a plant wouldn't go home and mistreat it. They wouldn't mm -hmm. just ignore it and not water it. Um, so if they were struggling with it, you would try to figure out what was going on with that plant and what could have possibly have happened and what they can do and what we can do to help them and that sort of thing. It was the ones that like, somebody would buy a barberry, like a one gallon barberry, $10.99 or $9.99, whatever it was. And they would take it home and bring it back a week later, completely fried and dead, still in its nursery container. Now keep in mind, we're a small garden center. We're not going, we're not burning through plants like crazy. So we still have some of those exact same barberries sitting out in the, the nursery and we're just watering once every day, you know? And they look fine. And they look great. And that person would assure you, I watered it. I watered it twice a day, you know? It's and like, you well, I watered it too yeah, and mine are okay. And mine look really good. And, and you just have to kind of like, just give them one. You have this plant guarantee policy. And I'm like, I know that you didn't take care of it. You ignored it. You forgot about it. Whatever the case may be, own it, <laughs> you yeah. know, instead of having us eat it because the garden center, the small mom and pop garden center eats the cost on that. And so like I could see, yeah, yeah. yeah but then you, you would have so upset I just know, talking about it. I know. And then uh, you have like the landscape landscapers that come in. In that case, I can kind of see if a homeowner is putting the money into hiring somebody to help them with the design, choose the proper plants, install them properly. Um, install the water. Install the water. Everything is set up. A lot of landscapers will guarantee the plants. It wasn't actually the garden center that would do it. The landscapers would guarantee it. Like I bought this healthy plant. I installed it 100% properly. The water's on drip. Like everything is automated. Um, if something goes wrong with that, then I will own the mistake. What I'm curious is like what percentage of the population truly believe in their heart of hearts that there was something wrong with the plant and that the garden center should be on the hook for it. Mm -hmm. Like, um, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Like, like there was a problem with that batch of plants, mm -hmm. you know, cause it's like, you've been involved long enough. I've been involved long enough that it's like, it's never the plants. Like you can't, or if it is, there's like a recall and everybody kind of knows about it. Mm -hmm. But like, we joke about um, crop failure. Yeah. <laughs> As just kind well, of Well, everybody like a, would say that. If you don't get a specific bulb that year, it's because yeah. of a crop oh, failure. Oh, crop failure. Yeah. yeah. But it's like, it's never the plant. It's always user error after the fact. You either watered it too much. So what are your thoughts on the big tree then? Well, I, I do put it in, I could see how someone could think it was hypocritical, mm -hmm. but I do put it in a different category. When someone is transplanting a mature plant, I think they kind of bake the insurance into the price. They would have to. It's expensive. It's, it's, it's a lot. It, like you're, you're, it's, it's so much. It's embarrassing to say, right? Yeah, yeah, it's we that don't, much money. Yeah. So it's an embarrassingly high dollar figure. And, and so I think that they bake it, the insurance cause they know that it's, it's a way riskier business transplanting a 30 foot tall mature tree, mm -hmm. you know, 60 miles down the road. Mm -hmm. That's risky. You know, planting a barberry, like selling a barberry and planting it, like the risk factor of that is way lower. Mm -hmm. So I think when somebody is going to the work of like cutting roots and in actually installing a tree, I think that that's in a different category than um, the nursery stock. You know, and in this case too, like the evergreens that we had installed at the same time, gorgeous. Norway spruce, Colorado blue spruce doing perfectly. The watering has been fine. Like everything we've done, we followed his instructions yeah. and we've been talking with him the whole time. He's been super great with us. And um, he knew actually, he told us when he moved it, he said, this is the hardest tree I've ever moved. Mm -hmm. 
And so we were kind of like, oh, you know, and he was a little tentative about coming this far down the road, but he's a professional, you know? And so we would, uh, I would kind of assume that he would advise, advise like, I'm not gonna move this because I don't think it's gonna thrive or whatever. Mm -hmm. But if he felt confident enough to do it, then I was like, okay, well, we'll spend the money on this, Trish. Yeah. You know, um, but the thing about it for and we me, we got no deals, by the way. No, like, we didn't get any discounts. We paid full price, mm -hmm. just like any other yeah. schmuck that <laughs> yeah. buys trees. Yeah, and the thing though, it had a couple of things going against it too. So first of all, when it got dug, so the tree was dug out, we had a huge rainstorm, and the truck got stuck in the field for two days. So that tree was sitting in that big cone thing digger for two days. Uh, that's not. That's not good for the tree. Also, when it was dry, driving, when it was riding here, it lost two huge big branches. So when the tree was actually installed, um, it wasn't the same tree we bought. Like it was a half of a tree. And it also broke another big main branch, a huge crack down and Aaron had to bolt it and it didn't end up surviving. Um, so I kind of was like, that's it's, not the actual plant I bought. <laughs> it yeah. looks horrible there next to our beautiful greenhouse. We've got this sick, half dead, half of a tree sitting here. Like, what do you it, do? I didn't think it looked horrible. I think, um, you it know, we were, trying, we were trying to be positive too. We were, But yeah. um, I was kind of trying to look at like, well, look, it will, it, you know, give it a number of years and it will fill out. Do you want to have to give a tree a number of years that you just paid that kind of money yeah, for? Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's just one of those things. I think I, we've learned through the process yeah. that evergreens are easier to transplant. Yep. Um, deciduous trees, uh, maybe if they're a little smaller, mm -hmm. I think that, that was pretty mature. I mean, mm -hmm. he said it was the hardest one he's ever moved. Yeah. So I, I kind of feel like maybe that was the limit, at least for, for him. Mm -hmm. I don't know if, um, you know, if you have different equipment or mm -hmm. I, I just don't know how the moving I didn't know works, there was but. any risk to breaking any branches. I just... Yeah, right. You know, I that was my and biggest if you take bummer. Three of the largest branches on any tree and remove them, it changes the look of a tree it a lot. It does. If you looked at it from one angle, it looked good <laughs> for a minute and then it started to like you know. Well, the other thing to keep in mind too about like a return policy or he you know, he's going to be re replaced. We're going to get a different tree from him mm -hmm. for those wondering. Um but what was I going to say? Oh, we have been in contact with him the whole time. Yeah, he's known. He's had pic You've sent him tons of pictures. When it's, when it's a large ticket item, you know, like that, it's, you know, like I text him. I send him pictures and I'm like, should I be giving it more water? And, and I'm doing what he's asking. So, yeah. like, I'm telling him I'm watering this much. And, and he told me he was, I would, I would do more. So, I start doing more. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's yeah. like, it's not just kind of like, oh, I sold you this tree. You're, you're on your own now. Yeah. It's like there's a And you're really Aaron is a really on. good communicator. Like you are really good at keeping up with stuff and communication. I am not. Many well, of you who is, know me know this. He doesn't he doesn't want to have to replace trees and it's such a large ticket item that, you know, it's worth it for him to communicate. Yeah. And try to give pointers or tips yeah. of like, "Well, I would do this or I would do this or, you know, you probably throw some chelated iron on there too because it's a maple and mm -hmm. that may help." Things like that. Mm -hmm. So, I feel like, you know, we communicated and and he we was really just, great. He came out and looked at yeah, it he, once. Mm -hmm. He did. Uh, I have no complaints with, with no. him. I feel no, like in fact, he's... I'm, I'm excited to go back out there. They actually came um, and took the root out and um, dug a different hole for a different evergreen we're going to put out in the South Garden. So yeah. I'm excited for that. We'll buy more trees from him. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it won't be a loss for him because we'll, we'll buy... We already have like several locations where we thought, well, we'd do, like to do another blue spruce here and you know, when we can. Also, just as like a side note, that tree was like significantly more expensive than a lot of other evergreens he sells. Yeah, so that one was like double the price of the Norway spruce that we bought. Yeah. And it was like a third more than the Colorado blue spruce. So those, and those are significant trees, they're big. So I think we'll just keep getting evergreens from him since we've had such a good experience with everything. Yeah, and we've had such great luck with all of our maples. We we decided deciduous trees will do as big as Jaker carries. Yeah. <laughs> you know, the wholesaler we go to that we get the big B&B &B trees, like that's as big. Two and a half, three inch caliper mm -hmm. is probably the biggest we'll go on, on deciduous at this point, just from what we've gone through. But uh, anyway, Saw B said, is working a date day? I think not do something else. <laughs> Well, yeah, you know what they say, do what you love and it will never, you'll never work another day in your life, right? right? <laughs> uh, new tree load, transplanting a ton of plants and picking a volunteer watermelon was the next video. And that one, we showed the new trees that we got on our date day. <laughs> we had a great time on it as well. Um, 
I transplanted a bunch of things. So the trees came in the morning, Aaron and Paul were handling that. Those trees are so heavy. And I'm like, at a point in my life, I'm like, I don't think I really want to be manhandling. You're over it. Yeah, I don't want to manhandle all of these huge, heavy things because my body is going to not, like my body is already kind of not happy with some of the things I've done in my past, mm -hmm. all the just heavy lifting and stuff. So I'm chilling out on that. If we've got guys around to help with it, then that's good. I mean, yeah. I, I want to, I want to be involved in stuff like that, but I'll just look from afar and enjoy the trees as they go in. So while they were doing that, I was transplanting a ton of things. I think I moved like, I don't know, a lot, a lot of plants, um, some big, beautiful sedum, hardy geraniums, um, some allium, some peonies, which are, they're not, <laughs> one of them's happy with me. The other two are not. So hopefully they bounce. Anyway, um, and then we picked one of the volunteer watermelon that came up in one of our annual beds, just randomly. It had three beautiful watermelon on it, and it was pretty darn good. Leah said, do you guys deal with black widows? Yes. I spray, of course, but they're out in the yard. You know, the only place that I have ever seen black widows here at our house, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think they're always just in irrigation boxes. Yeah. I'm not sure it's that almost I... almost a guarantee. Yeah. Just like about. You lift the lid and kind of like scoot it real fast, and then you yeah. look in there. Uh, they don't bug you, and we leave them alone. We don't kill them. I don't. No, I don't either. I did see one on one of our bags of fertilizer the day we were fertilizing, remember? Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. I, I saw one, like, I, and my dad has been bit by a black widow by grabbing a bag off of a stack of mm -hmm. uh, seed, like a pallet full of seed bags. Um, he was bit on the thumb. So it's one Good of those things. Good idea to wear gloves, I suppose. Yeah, and so probably now that I've seen it back there, I, I did kill that one, and I was kind of unintentional, actually. Um, the bag kind of, it freaked me out. I dropped the bag right on the spider. <laughs> <laughs> and then I ended up finding a bunch of those little circle egg sack things mm -hmm. all over the place. But uh, we don't we don't mess with them. They don't mess with us. I've never seen one in the house, anywhere in the house. Have you? Oh. No. Uh, Brian says, Fagus, is that how you say it? Fagus sylvatica, the Rosa, Roseo Marginata European beach, better known as Tricolor Beach. Do you have any experience with these? What would you plant one to? I have two. And no, I would not plant one. They burn every year in our area. Um, They're so glorious in the spring. They are. They are so pretty. And I don't know if they would be as pretty if you didn't have them in a sunny spot. If you had them as an understory tree, I think that's the only way you could get it to work here. If they got a little bit of morning sun and then were protected for the rest of the day. Mm -hmm. But I, I know that like even my parents, they have a huge one. And even theirs on the the protected side, it's still burned within an inch of its life by this time of the year. Um, so tough tree, they survive our winter. They're super slow growing. They're beautiful in the spring, but they're just not a good one to take you through the season. They look dead, like they completely do. dead in yeah. the summer. <sighs> they do. Allison said, my hardy geraniums only bloomed around the edge of the, of the clumps this past summer. What's up with that? How can I get them to bloom better next year? I'd divide them. Just cut them right in half and split them apart, cut them back, fertilize them, and then watch them do their thing. Rugged Mama Vlog said, do you have some fruit-bearing trees around your, in your garden? Yes, I do. Just this last week, I showed you our orchard with, we've got um, two apples, two apricots, a pear, two peaches, a nectarine, and a plum. Uh, and then we've got all the berries, like all the berries and the grapes. And we've got grapes in the back formal garden against the fence that are just, they're beautiful. And, tasty right now. I have a miniature fruit uh, peach tree by the chicken coop. I have an espalier pear, uh, comis, it's an Asian pear behind the greenhouse. The, they're beautiful right now. Perfection right now. Um, Do you have any pluots? No, my grandpa and my brother have pluots, so that's good. They, I usually can get some from them. if you ever talk about fruit trees, you'll hear about pluots. Oh, I tell my grandpa every time. Have you planted a pluot yet? Yeah. No. <laughs> no, I have not. <laughs> And you guys, at the back side of our new property, we have a walnut tree. Didn't know this, but we have a walnut tree and an apricot back there, old ones. TMY said, how long did it take to dig up and transplant all those plants? I know the video is edited, but you seem to get a lot of <laughs> done in one work session. It depends on the work session, but that one, I was probably out there for filming because I filmed it all myself. Four hours maybe to do all of it. How long would it have taken you if you weren't filming? Two hours, tops if I could wail into things and not worry about where, what angle I'm getting or if I'm making it interesting enough, which there's, there's some fun in that too because it does slow me down and it probably lets me do more yeah. in the work day. Um, but 
I mean, lets me do more in terms of like, I can go longer if I slow it down instead of if I do so much and I tire out quicker, quicker, but. It's funny because sometimes the creativity of making videos can be really fun. Yeah. And sometimes it can be really frustrating. It can, yeah. You know, like Most depending of the time on the it's project. okay. Most yeah. of the time it's fun. You know, the only times it's kind of, it feels like a little bit of a drag is if you're just not rested. If you're not feeling well, like, I mean, kudos to you for kicking it in for the recap today when you're not feeling top notch. But if you're extra tired, which that doesn't happen as much anymore now that the kids are a little older. Samantha, though, the other night had me up five times. Ugh five times in the night. And I think that day, I think that day was the day I did this. Really? I think that night was, yeah. I don't know, sometimes when you're feeling that way, it kind of kicks you into like adrenaline mode, like yeah. go time, we're gonna you know, get through the project. But I don't remember this one feeling like it was extra hard. I don't know, it was fun to be out there. Evelyn said, what's the story with the little, fa the little face on the tree? I don't think that's ever been explained. Um, that's Jeremy, <laughs> Jeremy on the juniper tree. That tree face was there when we bought the house. And I don't know if it was the previous owners who put it on the tree or the previous owners before that who put it on the tree. Aaron would get rid of it in a second, but I think it's hilarious. <laughs> I think it's good to have some quirks, like quirky things every once in a while because it makes people smile and it makes people like, especially if it's way out of the realm of what you usually see. Like if you usually see formality and like, I like formal gardens and like very tidy spaces and then you see this random thing like that, I think it's kind of funny. We used to have that uh, planter that was like the bottom half of a mouth. Oh yeah, I couldn't do that one. It was too modern though. Yeah. Yeah. And this one you can see from inside our house, like <laughs> from the, when I'm playing the piano. It's so weird. <laughs> I think it's funny. Uh, Willie said, Laura, you got so much done. Curious, how do you decide what area needs planting and when? Do you keep a lot of things to do or do you just wing it and plant spur of the moment? Most of it's wing it and plant spur of the moment. I rarely, rarely, rarely have a plan. And it is hard for me to come up with a plan. You know what? Planning shuts me down. It does. The second somebody wants to plan something, I'm like, why? Why am I like that? I'm like that with everything in yeah. my life. Like, I don't want to have a garden space planned out because then it makes me feel like uh, kind of locked in but and then, claustrophobic. I don't know. But then you'll complain later about how like, I don't know, it's just, I don't think it was really thought through. Like, you think? <laughs> I know, I know. But then I step back, I often remind myself like it's, it's just a garden, you know, when it comes down to it. Yeah. Like gardens can be changed. You can learn from your space. You can learn, you learn about yourself. And in the end, it's just a garden. It's not somebody's life. You know, yeah. it's not, it's not affecting, you know, the really important things in life. And it's okay. It's okay to not nail everything that you do yeah. out in the garden space. And I don't often. Okay. Last is this the last, yes, last video for this week was huge food harvest plus planting nine of the new maples. So um, Aaron, Paul, and a young man named Zeke came in to help plant those trees. And while they were doing that, I harvested a bunch of stuff out in the garden. And all of that stuff has since found new homes, which is awesome. Uh, so we did tomatoes, peppers. I had some cucumbers in there. Um, what else did I pick? Tomatoes, peppers, cucumbers. Was that nectarines again nectarines make it into every video right now because i love them devony said the tree close to the water line that was hand dug looked like access boxes there too are you worried about future years with the root system growing into these access boxes i'm not i'm not really i'm not worried about either you we've know, never had a root system go no and and if they did I, you know we'll just have Benny come and move the box, I guess. <laughs> yeah, but that's not always possible. No, it's not. So but in a situation like that where you need the symmetry, I guess you just have to decide what's more important. What the risk, you know, the yeah. risk versus reward. Yeah. I feel like the reward of having them all in a line is greater than the risk of needing to move a box sometime down the road. Because those boxes can be moved. Like it's it's like um, I would guess maybe like a well for Benny's crew maybe like a two hour maybe a three hour project sure. so you just have to do like the math in your head like yeah. can i afford to have somebody come and do a three hour project for me if uh there's or an move it yourself or if, move it yourself for three yeah. hours for them would be like a weekend for us to yeah. dig up and move that um and fortunately out there it was it's open enough and it's pretty like it's pretty malleable like you said i don't know if you use that word i heard you say that at some point today anyway it's yeah. pretty malleable out there 
Um, so it's kind of easy to move stuff around, but there's times where like I think about moving stuff in our old garden and how much of a pain. Yeah. Like I probably would have just, I mean, in those cases, you would just be smarter about where you put your trees. Yeah, well, you're right. Out in the grass area, yeah. it's very malleable because you've yeah. got so much open space to reroute lines mm -hmm. if necessary. So it's not, you're not in like close quarters. Certainly, you know, if you're planting trees, like a big, huge tree right next to the foundation of your home, probably a bad idea. You know, mm -hmm. like don't. Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. But, um, but an irrigation box, you know, out, I'm not as concerned about it, I guess. Sure. Brian and Tammy said, oh my gosh, love, love, love the row of trees. You inspire us all to plant. Do you know how someone can find large tree growers close to where one lives? Google it. <laughs> I don't Search know. Search tree farm or Yeah, ask your local garden center first. Tree nursery? Yeah. Just ask people. I mean, ask you people. You could ask local landscapers too. Because yeah. I feel like Benny always has some new place he knows about that yeah. I never did when I was down at the garden center. Yeah, if you see somebody installing trees somewhere, just like pull, pull over. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, where do you get trees from? Yeah. Ruth said, okay, well, who else saw the enormous hole by driveway entrance at 105? I think a new big tree is coming soon. So exciting. And you would be correct, Ruth. So we are going to get, I think, out there. There's kind of a blue uh, Vanderwolf pine nearby. And then there's other like blue potum, potum, <laughs> I was going to say potum toll. Totem pole panna comes, and there's also a blue willow. I, I think in like a green Norway right mm, there. Big yeah. green Norway would be so pretty right there. And there's one that's a lot smaller, very nearby. It'd be pretty eventually to have like a little trio of Norways right there in that corner. Yeah. It won't be till next month that that happens. We need to go out and take a look at them. We're just waiting for Nathan uh, to say when to he say can when come it's transplant. Good. Lynn said, what would I do without my daily dose of garden answer to begin my day? Oh. You never fail to deliver quality content with homespun personality. Love you guys. It's really sweet. Question. After seeing your hose links in so many of your videos, I decided to purchase two for my own yard. I haven't installed them yet because I keep noticing the many different ways you have yours installed. Metal post, 4x4 four four post, on the side of the post, or drilled down into the top. Can you tell me what you think the best method has been for your installation? I really like to get these in and up and running before the weather changes, but your opinion and experience is very important. Do you I have think a, the one inch pipe is the the best like way to do it. Like on top of a on top of a four by four. Like the little Yeah, you could do it on top of a four by four or you can just you know, you can just dig a hole and, and put concrete. You have more spinning. I mean you can, spins you can all, spin the way it all the way around. around. <coughs> Eventually it will stop because you only have so much lead hose yeah. to spin. But. If you only, you know, if you're putting it up like next to a house, you don't need the three sixty spins, so mm -hmm. it's kind of irrelevant. But um and you also do kind of need to either like like splay out the top so it's not cutting mm -hmm. um, or like weld a little like topper piece on maybe there. we should go around and show the different ways we have ours. we should do that in a video sometime yeah right? that would maybe be helpful just to kind of see and we can kind of talk through what the good and bad of each one of them is maybe we should add that in here yeah. pretty quick rainy days said did your green zebra tomato plant produce any tomatoes and did you like them never again I have given green zebra so many chances to grow and thrive in our garden and it never has. So it never will ever again. I am not going to waste my time on that anymore. Also, I, I grew so many just random varieties of tomatoes this year. So many of which were just the biggest disappointment, pretty tomatoes, but just not there in the flavor department. And you know, it's, it's uh, fun to, to experiment. Um, but this next year, I kind of want to rely on those things that I know when I pick it or give it to somebody. That's the thing. Like we dedicate all this space for these tomatoes and I don't even really want to give these tomatoes to other people because they're not, they're not amazingly flavored. They are going to, uh, Bethany who helps us out here. She has pigs, so they are being utilized. They are food for her pigs, um, which is awesome. But you know, you kind of want to dedicate room in your garden to things that you'll actually eat and or feel good about giving to other people. Sam said, have you ever frozen tomatoes? All you have to do is wash them and pop them in plastic bags and into the freezer. They are great in any dish that requires simmering. I've never done that, ever. You know, we, sh we the problem, we, we lack freezer space. We really do. Yeah. We always get, we get my, so my parents raise cows and we always do like half a beef is a year. Uh, and that takes up our entire second freezer. And we do utilize like everything pretty much. I mean, I've done yeah. really well this year. Um, and we've been able to give away everything that we haven't. There's certain cuts that we just like, don't I don't use it quickly. 
Yeah, like ground beef, we end up with so much ground beef and I do use a lot of ground beef, but not as much as we get. So typically that like half of that can just go out the door right at the gate. Um, but it's still like we need a second freezer for produce, really. But that's a really good idea. In fact, after I did that video, there were lots of good suggestions in the comment section. I always appreciate that so much because I do learn a lot from you guys. Digs in Dirt said, what variety of green pepper did you grow? They're huge, they are huge. Those are California wonders. Like they're the standard green bell pepper that we always had at the garden center. And I got those, did I start those ones from seed? Can't remember if I started them from seed or if I bought them in packs. Either way, that's what those big green ones were. And oh my word, so, so productive. I got, gave all of those away, all of the peppers. And there's still so many on the plants. I just thought, well, I'm gonna get another huge harvest of these peppers before the season's out. So we'll have plenty to do. Like I didn't end up chopping any of them up that day. I thought I was going to and I didn't, um, but maybe with the next crop. Mrs. Johnson said, why do you choose autumn blaze maples rather than red point maples like you have in your other long row of trees? It's the shape thing. First of all, um, red points grow more conically. We wanted something more round that would give that huge, big kind of like stately look. Um, and they don't get quite as big. I think uh, red points, what, 45 by 35? Mm -hmm. While autumn blazes get, autumn blazes? Autumn blaze gets 50 by 40. So you've got a larger statured tree. I think the growth rate once Autumn Blaze is established is just every bit as quick. We don't deal with uh, helicopters on either one of those, even though um, the Autumn Blaze has silver maple in it. It's a mix between red and silver maple. Um, anyway, that's why. We just needed to get like the biggest tree we possibly could that we knew would thrive in our area that we could limb up in order for you know, the, right, the right height so trucks could get through and such. And that is it for this week's recap video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope you're having a great day. Have a great week and we will see you in the next one.